Today's text is a great text. This is what all the previous commands of Titus are grounded in. This passage that we're going to be studying today, it acts as the thesis statement for the rest of the book. So this is an amazing text that we're going to look at. The, the churches, they had problematic leaders, as we have studied before, doctrine and behavior, and the Apostle Paul has left Titus on the island of Crete to strengthen out these wayward churches. So the lessons for each of these topics that we have looked at are crucially tied to today's section of the letter. If you're a Christian here today, or I'm sorry, if you're a non-Christian here today, you may think that church is a place for people who they want to feel better about themselves, or they're trying to be good enough for God in some way. You may think that uh, that's, that's what this is about. And if that's you today, we're going to be talking about a word that you may not have ever understood. It's grace. I know that you've heard it before. We were just singing it. But, you know, you can turn on the TV. You can just look at your family history, maybe your own personal life. And I'm confident that you have noticed there seems to be a problem. Little girls, they grow up wanting to marry a great man and live a happy life with children in a home. However, instead, we see this. We've seen this, haven't we? We see heartbreak. We've seen divorce. We've seen the pain of broken homes. It's affected us. Little boys from great conservative families with such potential find themselves addicted to different kinds of vices at young ages. This is, this is a problem that we have. Fathers or mothers who were faithful to their families for years, we've seen walk out one day with someone else. Sin is deep-rooted in the heart of everyone. And its end is destruction. The consequence for any sin is death. We have a real problem. Not one of us can live righteously, and it's shown every day. And we do not deserve life. We do not. This is why we sing this song about amazing grace. But what is this connection? Have you noticed the problem? You can fill it in. It's our fallenness from God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for your grace that has shown itself to those who know you in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace that trains us as Christians. Lord, that disciplines us, that instructs us. Lord, I pray that today our faith will grow based on your word, Lord, that you will grow our faith, Lord. You will give us the grace to grow as well, Lord. And for those who do not know you, Lord, I pray that you let them see that grace has appeared and give salvation. Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's read today's passage. Today's passage, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So here's what the passage is saying. In every age, the grace of God saves sinners and trains them to live godly lives. I'm going to say that again. In every age, the grace of God, it saves sinners and trains them to live godly lives. Grace has appeared. As, uh, as Pastor Andrew mentioned, we were on a senior trip this last week. I took the seniors from the high school group to Georgia, and it was a fun time. You can go ahead and show some of the pictures from our trip. And there was this night in which I signed us up. Um, every night we were doing something in nature that was a lot of fun, but we signed up for an adventure. It was a walk through 
a, uh, a gorge in the middle of Georgia, in the middle of the mountains at night. So at 11 o'clock at night, we were able to see the full moon and we were on a suspension bridge in between a gorge and it was amazing. Go ahead and show the pictures of the waterfall at night. It was amazing. <laughs> it really was. Look, look, at, look, show the next one. Look, it was, it was so nice. No, it really was. It really was. You can't see it in the pictures, but it was a beautiful sight. But listen to this. We, we end up saying to the tour guide, you know, we're done. We saw the moon. Um, it's getting late. We got to get back. It was 11 o'clock, maybe 11.30. And so we tell her, the five of us, we're gone. You don't have to count on us anymore. Most of the people had already left up the trail. It was a far trail. And it was at night. So we left our guide, and we started making our way back to our destination. Well, this is what happened. We start walking, and we're walking joyfully, not a fear in the world, at night, walking through the woods, and you know what we saw? We saw a bench that we hadn't seen before. What's this bench doing here? I don't remember seeing this. Maybe we missed it on the way up. Okay, keep walking, guys. We're going to keep going. We're going to find our way out of here. We're not lost. <laughs> so we keep on walking, and uh, oh, two benches. Okay, this is weird. Must, must have missed it. We were distracted. There was a whole group of us. Okay, keep on going. We keep going deep into these woods. It's at night. The park is closed. We don't know where anybody is. Well, we keep on walking, and then we see this sign. And the sign says, danger. And it's talking about death and destruction for humans. It's scary. We're like, okay, hey, we would have seen this. We definitely would have seen this. We are lost. Okay, let's turn around. Start heading back. We keep going. We're seeing new things again on the same trail we were just on. It's crazy. We're lost. Now, I'm not showing this because I'm the leader. So we're going to keep on walking through these woods, boys. We're going to find our way. Meanwhile, Eduardo has sung more hymns than ever before and quoted scripture. He is scared. We are scared, but we're not showing it. So we keep on walking. Eventually, we get off the trail. We think maybe this is the right direction. It's at night. We're, we're, we're off the trail. We're going through some areas. We're jumping a fence, and then we see this, the most beautiful thing. Look at that white van. Shining. <laughs> shining through the woods. There was this glimmering light. Could that be it? It's our white van. What a beautiful sight that was. So similar to that, that story that I just told you, there's a story in Acts 27 where Paul uses this word appeared that we're seeing in our text. Paul uses the same word appeared, okay, in our text twice. And it's the same Greek word that we get the word epiphany from. Now when Paul uses it, he's lost as well. He's actually shipwrecked. Or before he gets shipwrecked, they're out at sea, and it's so bad, the storm, like a hurricane, that you can't see the stars, you can't see anything to guide you in the night. And then it appears, and we could see that in Acts 27, verse 20, it says, when neither sun nor stars, there's your word, appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Lost this hope. You could circle hope there um, if you have that. If not, write it down. But... Here's what we see. It was always present. The stars weren't gone during the storm. They were always there, even though, you could fill this in, present, even though it was hidden. So grace has existed from the beginning. This is what this text is saying. Grace has existed from the beginning. But what is the grace of God that has appeared? Why didn't Paul use the word grace started or grace has begun? He could have said those things, except it wouldn't be true, so he doesn't. Because this grace has always been in existence, even if you couldn't see it. God is so gracious that it overflows out of his character and nature to people from the beginning. Christians, this grace did not appear 2,000 years ago. It's always been there, but it does appear in a way that we're gonna be looking at, which changes everything today. So it was hidden. Fill that in. It was hidden. It was hidden before then. Mysteriously shining through God's grace in the Old Testament was shining through his chosen people. And it was saying, come, come and see. Fill that in. Come and see. That's what it was saying. With glimmers as well to people from other nations, we see lives that are utterly doomed, undeserving of God's grace. This is the concept. We do not deserve his grace. We don't deserve any of God's good favor not one good thing that you have experienced in this life do you deserve. And then they experience even more grace. Not only 
living, but experiencing the grace of God, salvation, and even greater grace. So we see this with um, different examples like Rahab and Ruth. You could fill those two names in as well. But then God's grace in the New Testament is go tell, right? We know the Great Commission. We know Jesus Christ before sending to the Father. That's what he says. He says, go and tell. This is now the way it has appeared. So what changed? What has appeared here? That God would become a man, listen to this, and be the sacrifice for sin, that through faith in what he has done, people could have salvation. This is amazing. This is not doom. This means that God has given us a way to be saved, that we do not only have 70 years of life expectancy here offered to us. There is grace to where we can have salvation and peace with God through Jesus Christ. This is what the New Testament is so great. It shows what was always there. The grace of God has always been Christ, but now it reveals itself as always being there, and we see it in Jesus Christ. Look at Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, and you can fill out that God graciously chooses the people of Israel to become a people of his own possession to display his glory. Yes, his glory, his grace. Not because of anything that God saw in the people of Israel, though. Look at this. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. For you are a people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession, circle possession in your notes there. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. It's not because they deserve it. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you, underline loves you, and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you, circle redeemed you, from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Wow, this text, there's so many themes that are tying in to the text that we're looking at today. That is on purpose. God is the writer of all of this. And he's inspired Paul to write this in the same way to be showing how these lines are drawn. Christ has appeared. He's been showing himself the whole time. So in Exodus, he saves them out of slavery, out of slavery, and purifies them for his own possession. The story of Exodus is amazing because it comes after Genesis where man has been separated from God because of sin. That's right. All of the problems in the world that we were, that we were just talking about, that's in us. We have the same sin problem. And what can we do? We can't be righteous. What can we do? We're separated from God because we're truly wicked people. We do not deserve the Lord. We've looked at the Lord who gave us everything, and we've chosen to do things our own way and trust in our own ways. We've taken a different route, and it has cost us everything. We do not deserve redemption. We do not deserve God. Look at this. The question in Genesis and Exodus is how could God, being holy, dwell with people who are such sinners? How can he do that? And as you read this, you see the way that God reveals himself and shows his grace to come to the people, to choose them, to display his love and grace in redeeming them back. You see, sin separates us to an eternal hell without a relationship with God. That's what we deserve. And this is not just a place for people on the evening news. This is us really is. There's a problem in all of us. This is for you and me. This is awful news, and people are going to hell every day if they die apart from God's saving grace in Jesus Christ. So his grace alone is how man can be saved from the wrath upon our sin. And we see glimpses of the mystery of Christ being revealed from the beginning of the Bible. We see it's always present, but shining through. Jesus on the road to Emmaus, my how I would love to be at this Bible study where Jesus Christ explains this. Look at Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, look at what Jesus does. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He goes through all the scriptures from beginning to end, and he shows how it's about Christ. See, grace is personified in Christ. And this was revealed Yes, 2,000 years ago. 
But Colossians 1.26 says that the mystery was hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. This is amazing grace. This is why we go and tell, because it truly does save people. So the whole Bible is about Christ. So it brings salvation for all people. What does this text mean here? This letter was written to people in the Roman Empire. So we're looking at now the New Testament. God's grace is no longer shining most of the people of Israel alone, not most of them alone anymore. Now the floodgates of grace are open wide to whosoever would believe upon Christ. Grace being the undeserved favor of God is amazing, even if just one person, even if one person received grace, it would be amazing. Because none of us deserve it. Not one of us. Adam and Eve deserve to be destroyed upon sinning. And God lets them live? This is amazing. So, um, this verse is not saying that people are automatically saved. And I must say that there are churches that do not understand this grace. They do not understand this grace and they do not love people as loving as they want to look because they do not teach salvation through Jesus Christ alone, through God, through Christ alone. They don't teach that. And they teach that all men are saved. And they hate them by letting them believe a lie and be damned to hell rather than giving them what has appeared. Go and tell them this good news. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. This means that since Christ has appeared to all people, even people in Crete can have salvation. Even people in Hollywood, Florida can have salvation. But it means every class. It means every type of person. Every type of life. It doesn't matter. His grace is not limited to that. That is what this text is saying. So when Titus is speaking to older men and younger men and elders and older women and younger women and even people who are enslaved. This class distinction does not separate God's grace. God's grace is more powerful than all of that. So, it's without exception or distinction to types of people. There's no type of person that God cannot save. God's grace can save any type of person in any part of life who repents and trusts in Jesus. His grace is now shining for all. This is why Titus is to teach all people in the church how to live. This is why he's teaching all of them how to live. Because God's grace has appeared to all people. So in Christ, grace is personified. And grace affects how every person lives. When you come in contact with Christ, you do not stay the same. Verse 14 says, when, um, Who gave him his, himself, speaking about Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. And that word redeem is key. We're not staying there in lawlessness. In lawlessness, the people of Israel are suffering under the oppression of what looks like man when he trusts in himself. The the kingdom of Egypt with Pharaoh is what it looks like when man is God. And they are enslaved to all of that. But it's so paradoxical that when God saves them, he redeems them and purifies them as his own possession by saving them and then giving them the law, which is also his grace. Because he gives them the context of how to live as saved people. He teaches them this that you were just in, in Egypt, that's awful. Don't go back to that way of living. So the law is not something to be understood as putting putting a burden on the people that is evil. The law actually puts grace to the people by showing the character of God himself. Now the people are going to misunderstand the law and Jesus Christ is going to appear and show what it means. He is going to do that. But there are going to be people who are going to be in bondage thinking that they can make themselves righteous by the law. But what the law is going to do, the beauty of the law is that it's going to show God's character. Because the law being an extension of God himself, it's his words, It's how the people should look as saved people. He's saying, you're saved. This is what it looks like to be saved. You are now going to image me as you were supposed to do, not image yourselves and look like Pharaoh and create this slave society where everyone is in abuse and and is an enemy of God. But instead, when you image God, you love the law because the law is what shows you who God is. Because you can study the law the way that Psalm 119 talks about 
Go ahead and write Psalm 119 on your outline there. You're going to look at that later. You can study the law, and as you study it, you can be like the psalmist who is in love with it, but not because it brings righteousness. He's in love with it because it is the character of God shining through. So when Jesus comes on earth, he's not going through a checklist of, okay, i got to be perfect, so what it means to fulfill the law means check, check, check. No, the law is the character of Jesus. So when we obey the law and we seek to be like Jesus as saved people, we can be pleasing to him as our hearts desire. If our hearts are new and now desire that. So, sounds paradoxical. If you don't understand grace, you won't understand that God giving the law actually brings freedom. But Jesus is a redeeming Savior in God, and he dies in the place of those sinners who break this law, and he gives them redemption from sin by faith. You could fill that in, from sin by faith, for those who trust him. He saves us from our sin. This grace is one that changes our lives from slaves to sin to free in Christ, which as we have talked about in the book of Titus, means slaves to God. We are now in bondage to the Lord, and it means freedom. So when God contacts the people of Israel, they go from being slaves to being free. God is also going to contact not only slaves, he's going to contact sick people in the Bible, and he's going to contact sinners. So in Egypt, we see that he gives them the law, which identifies them, gives them the character, and he purifies them through that. They're going to image him. But we also see Jesus. Jesus in the Gospels, what does he do? He contacts sick people, and their identity goes from being people who are known as being unclean, That's what they're known as. They have to even yell being unclean. They're known as unclean people, and there's a connection here that the Lord is teaching us in these passages between sin and uncleanliness. And when Jesus contacts those who are sick, they're healed. They're no longer sick. They go from unclean to clean. And this is connected with sin. He contacts sinners, and they're saved to live righteous lives. Go and sin no more. That's what he says. Do you want to be clean? Repent of your sin. Trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in what he has done. Trust in the grace that has appeared. Verse 12 says now, training us to renounce ungodliness. So there's two major things that grace does. And this text is explaining them. There's two major things. It brings salvation to all people and it trains us. Which means it instructs us. It disciplines us. This is great. This is from grace. This is not a bad thing. And it's the power that does it in us. It says, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Grace trains us as saved people. Not as unsaved people, but as saved people, it trains us. When does it train us? In the present age. Some people, they think that grace is not that powerful. They lack faith in the power of grace in their lives. And a part of that is because of a good theology that they have. See, here at Sheridan Hills, I'm thankful that we don't teach Christian perfection. I'm thankful for that. But here's what sometimes happens in a, in a person's mind. Because they know that, they begin to doubt the power of grace in their present life. But God's grace is powerful, and we must not doubt this. It has the power to change us. Anything good that God has already done in your life after saving you in making you more and more like Christ is not of your own doing, it is of grace. It's of his power, of him powerfully working within us. So grace trains us as a saved people. However, don't let the fact that we will not be perfect here take away the force that these verses are teaching. Just because a rocket cannot take you to the sun does not mean that it doesn't have the power to take you to the moon. Still a very powerful thing, and this grace will eventually perfect us as well. So listen to the power of grace in this verse for the present age. Verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. This is what it's talking about doing right now. To renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Listen, I know we know right and wrong usually. I know it's usually pretty obvious, the outward things, right? The outward and the obvious. You could feel that in the outward and the obvious. Sometimes those are pretty obvious, especially if you've grown up listening um, in church. However, sometimes we don't think deeply enough about why these things are wrong. 
Sometimes we can just think that's bad and that becomes all that we know. Like drunkenness, cheating on your taxes, watching bad movies, vulgar speech. It's easy to identify those things as bad, but why? Grace trains us to put off these things. It's true. And by God's grace, there are testimonies of lives here at Sheridan Hills that have been saved from adultery and thievery and homosexuality and greed and many other forms of worldliness. God's grace has done that. And it continues to do that today. All these outward and obvious sins, like we said, they're wrong. But perhaps as we study the inward and the hidden sins, we can see more clearly how grace transforms us. So let's look at the inward and the hidden. I'm talking about the thoughts that haunt you, that draw you in constantly. I'm talking about things that you actually want. Things you find yourself desiring passionate for. This is not just limited to sexual sin, although the Bible clearly does talk about that. This can be anything we do that distracts us from Christ or dulls our affections towards him. Anything that dulls our affections from the grace that has appeared. This is referring to those things that you want more than to trust God's will in the present age. But this passage is showing that the grace of God saves and it trains. The same power that saves, it trains. So why is it that we believe in the supernatural work of God when it comes to saving us and causing us to be born again, but at times then we doubt its supernatural power to actually change us in the present? We shouldn't do that. This is all God's powerful, amazing grace. So anything in your life that is distracting you in the present age from the grace of this passage is ungodly and worldly. Grace trains us to set aside every weight, like the book of Hebrews says, that is holding us back. Anything that is holding us back from God's will because we have a new hope. We can sin as simply as wanting an easy, just a simple life. One where we just have, you know, we have it just set out to where everything is worked out right. We can sin as easy as that. And not that having peace and quiet are sinful, but if that's what we are desiring and searching for and going after rather than trusting God's will for us in the present age, then that is not from the Lord. Therefore, the many commands of Scripture, what happens when we read the Bible, all these commands of Scripture to build His kingdom rather than our own are ignored, and we sin. So this inward desire for things in this life that promise to bring us satisfaction, that is unconnected to the faith in the grace that we are talking about here, the faith of God coming and dying on the cross for the sins of those who trust in him, anything that's taking away from that, that inward desire in life that believes in those promises that are not thinking of that is not in faith in that, and is not in faith in the glory that is to come that this text is talking about. It's sin. See, it, it whispers to us and it tells us, and it subtly shifts our faith to something else. It tells us, this is going to bring you that happiness you're looking for. This is going to bring you that satisfaction. And our thoughts don't come out in words like that all the time. You see, sometimes it happens to us when I'm at Home Depot, and I look at this magazine of something beautiful, and I just open up, and I'm looking at this home and I'm not hearing these sentences come to my mind, but I find myself drawn to a life of comfort and prestige and pride. And I realize this is not what I should be desiring apart from faith in Jesus Christ. I'm believing a lie that as I'm looking at this, this is going to bring me the happiness that I need, that I want, rather than remembering about the grace that has already appeared to save me and therefore the life I live looking forward with blessed hope to the future of Jesus Christ and glory. It's so subtle the way sin works and it's so pervasive. So what desires in your heart do not match up with godliness? What desires in your heart do you know are worldly? Why don't they match up with this godliness, with this grace that we're talking about? Are we seeking the prestige that comes with opportunities? Or are we believing the lies that it will bring us satisfaction we desire apart from Christ? Are we taking every thought that comes in captive in light of the cross as we live? Are we pondering the work of Christ on the cross, his past work 
and his future glory. If we do this, our present decisions will be in grace instead rather than trusting in lies that will not satisfy ultimately. So, here's a question. What is your definition of successful living in the book of Titus? What do you see Paul explaining as successful living? What is he arguing for? Does that match up with the thought you have when I say life is successful? When I talk about your life being successful, does it match up with the things that the Lord is saying, this is godly? This is what living a life of faithfulness looks like. Or do we desire the temporary fulfillments here instead? Now, grace empowers us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly in contrast to these things. I recently uh, was convinced to take a self-defense class. Somebody from the church convinced me to do it, and I've now gone alone a few times. But they teach me something pretty cool. You see, I went to this class, and this very large, strong man grabs me by the neck and puts me in a headlock, and there's absolutely no way I'm getting out of this. I trust in my strength, and I push with everything I have, and I cannot get out of it. But it doesn't work. And my instructor comes up to me and says, listen, instead, put off, listen to this biblical language that I'm tying in here, put off trusting in your own strength to rip his elbow off your neck and drive your elbow into his. And it worked! Little me against this big guy, and now... All of a sudden, I'm not in a headlock. And time after time, it pr- I practiced it and it worked. It was amazing. How is this working? This is very interesting. So, the book, I'm sorry, the Bible is filled with teaching us to put off trusting in ourselves and put on trusting in God. You can see so many, so many different verses throughout this. I only put a few in your outline there and you can see them underneath put off and put on. Put off trying to do things by your own strength. Put off believing in these promises that are not going to fulfill. You've been born again to a living hope. You've been born again to one that has a future glory. Remember these things. Put on Christ. Put on his character instead. So... To live self-controlled, upright, godly lives, today we are told, do what makes you happy. Dive into your desires. Make your own meaning and purpose. That's what we're told today. But grace empowers us to live a self-controlled life. Here's what grace does. Grace causes us to have a new hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Underline, born again to a living hope. That's 1 Peter 1.3. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has caused us. He has caused us. He has caused us to be born again and now inside of us we have a living hope. That's a new heart with a new hope. And that's looking forward to the glory of God. Our hope is changed through Jesus Christ, through what he has done and what he is going to do. So to wait in the present means that there's a past element that is pushing us forward. That's what you're seeing there on your outline. There's a past element that is pushing us forward, and there is a future element that is pulling us. We did a maze with the high school around Christmas time this last year. We did a maze, and it was amazing. It really was. That's a pun. We were up in the heights, and we made all these walls, and we turned off all the lights, and we blacked out all the windows. And then we had the students line up at the door and we would let them in one by one. And the students were in there and they had to trust in what they could see, which was nothing. So they had to trust in their hands and feet, right? Sounds, feeling around, they're bumping into each other. It's a really loud, chaotic little scene. They're trying to get through this maze. But here's the thing. We blacked out the windows, but every time we would open the door, light would flood into the room. And then the students would all be able to see and they'd make it a little farther in this maze. So we had to let them in one by one very quickly. I put somebody by the door and I said, all right, go, 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 close the door. Go, 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 close the door. And then the other problem was at the front of our maze, underneath the door to the ending of the maze, when you win, when you make it to the end, under the door was light shining through the crack. 
And the students were in between these two sources of light on their way. We have a future blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God himself. He has appeared and he's going to one day appear in glory. Yes, he appeared on a donkey. Yes, he fulfilled prophecy there, but he's also coming on the clouds in future glory. The second coming of Christ. It changes the way that we live. His grace changes the way that we live our lives. So this is the restoration of the world away from sin. The promise of Jesus Christ coming back in glory. It is great news because the suffering that we have here, it's temporary. Romans 5, 1 through 5 explains some of this, how this grace works through trials. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Oh, is this what Nick Johns was quoting last week? Yes, it is. Let's keep reading. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we have peace with God? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through God himself who came down. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this glorious grace. This is what we're talking about, the salvation. That's the saving grace that we're talking about today in which we stand. And we rejoice in this grace, right? In the hope. Sounds like our blessed hope in the glory of God. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces more of this hope. And this hope is connected with our salvation. And it does not put us to shame, because our hope is not empty. It is a living hope. Because God's love has been poured out, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So knowing the gospel's future means that our trials are used as part of his training to increase our hope in the glory of God. So what he's doing here in this life, these unfortunate events that we see, is part of him increasing our faith and our hope in the glory of Christ. So if you are a Christian suffering today, I encourage you to memorize this passage. I encourage you to pray that God will increase your hope, that these trials won't be a waste. So turn and ask the Lord to grow your faith as you suffer. So now let's look at this this past thing that God has done. It says in the verse, who gave himself to redeem us and purify us for his own possession. This is what it sounds like. It sounds like that same passage in Deuteronomy. That's right, God has been writing all of this. Yes, that is the Old Testament language. So there's two parts to this. He redeems us and he's also purifying us, okay? He redeems us from lawlessness. This is what Christ has done for us in purchasing us by his death on the cross. This is the promise of eternal life. This is what we talk about when we say heaven. This comes through Jesus Christ, through his redemption. Jesus accepts you, it's true, he does. He accepts anyone from anywhere doesn't let you stay there. He doesn't. He redeems you out of that. Don't doubt the power of God's grace when it comes to sanctification. I know that we, we sit here and we say God's grace is what converted us. It's what gave us this, this hope. It's what taught us the cross. But it's also what trains us. The Bible is supernatural. Don't start doubting it now that you're a Christian. So, It redeems us from lawlessness. This is the promise of eternal life. And it also purifies us to being zealous for good works. So when you read Psalm 119 and you see the heart of someone who is zealous for good works, it's not because it justifies you, but it's because you know the character of God when you read his words and you desire to image him as you ought to. Because you are made in his image and it's been restored to his image when you get the new heart. When you understand the cross and you trust in Jesus Christ. So it purifies us and it purifies us to being zealous for good works. Okay, last point on future glory. The future glory of the Lord is described as a city with no sun or moon. Listen to this. The future glory is described as a city with no sun or moon. In Revelation 21, you can read this as well. Go ahead and write that down. Revelation 21. Some more homework. We will not live as we do in this present age, in between these two sources of light. 
kind of the way we live right now, where there is a moon and a sun going around the earth, always there but appearing every day, different moments. Instead, listen to how Revelation 21 describes. It says, and the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, has no need for it. For the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. The lamb, the Passover lamb. We're seeing Christ in the Old Testament. What is the lamp of grace that is shining through? It's going to be the lamb. And it's not just going to be that distant glimmering thing in front of us like that van I was talking about. Like the way we are in the present age, believing in the promises but not fully seeing them. As we spoke about yesterday, it is the already but the not yet. I'm sorry, not yesterday, last Sunday. Pastor Andrew was making that point. But it's amazing that when we are in heaven, when we are with the Lord, when we are glorified with God, the light that we are talking about is the Lamb, fully shining. It's not going away. And so therefore our trust is not like the maze where we're searching our way out, looking to the future light and looking at the past light. Instead, it's perfected, perfected grace in our lives. That is the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. This is amazing. So when you sit there and you're struggling with sin in your life and you're wondering, God, when are you going to get rid of this? Look forward to the hope that comes with the glory of God to where you will never sin again because your trust, your faith will be perfected in Christ. You will be hidden in Christ. You will no longer have the sin struggle here. Doesn't that drive you to look forward to the hope of glory as Christians? when your righteousness is not showing and you find yourself in sin, look to Christ who fulfilled the law. Look to him. He's perfect. Look to the way you are one day going to be with a perfected faith that is shining with Jesus Christ perfectly. This is amazing. This is the concept that we have of grace. This is what transforms us. It is a supernatural concept. This is the word that changes everything. So living as people between the light of the past and the light of the future, just like the maze between the two lights, how should we live? The last word in this passage that we're going to focus on is for. It's the first word. Because it ties into the rest of the text. For the grace of God has appeared. This is why God desires elders to be one woman men. Why? Not drunkards, not quick-tempered, not greedy, because those are all coming from a heart that is believing that the present age is going to satisfy. But the heart of someone who understands the grace and the gospel and is going to be able to teach it needs to be able to show how to live in the present age based on the power of grace that he is looking forward to and that he's looking back to and saying thank you. Because their actions show that they don't understand when they're drunk. Because they're trying to be drunk here being satisfied here. They don't understand what it means to live in the present age in light of the past grace and the future grace. And they are the ones that are going to teach it? No. Not the people of God's own possession. Not those who he is purifying. That will not be his church. How could they teach us faith in the grace of Jesus that is powerful enough to transform our lives as we trust in the work of the cross and the return in his glory, when their actions are centered on here in the present age. Christian, this is what you are all called to do. This is the example that we see in the book of Titus. For the grace of God has appeared. Older women are not to be slanders. Come on. You're talking about an ability to cause people to be redeemed by sharing the light, the hope of glory, grace, And instead you're going to slander when instead you could teach them what is good. Look at that put off, put on. If you're concerned with the present age, you'll slander because this is all there is. That's what the heart looks like. But a heart with a blessed hope, supernatural blessed hope, now looks at people and doesn't slander when they see things wrong. But they care and they teach what is good. Wow. Because in the light of grace, it doesn't make sense to live any other way. Think about it. If sin and hell are real and God's grace and the hope of his glory are amazing and powerful, then it is sin. It really is. It is sin not to teach those who are younger these things. Please teach them. It's what you're called to do. 
So our lives, in light of his grace, are transformed. Younger men, be self-controlled. If you told me that the world was ending tomorrow, there's a high chance that you know what would happen? I would think, oh, I'm going to go steal a Ferrari. I only have one more day. In the present age, this is all we have. But when I put that off, and I look to the hope of future glory, and I look to what I've been redeemed from, that lawlessness, and now I want to live self-controlled in light of grace. For the grace of God has appeared. Younger men, be self-controlled. That's why First Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. He doesn't say, go crazy, like you may be tempted to do if you told a high schooler, what would you do if you only had one more day to live? Oh, the atrocities and sin, right? But he says, be self-controlled. Because if you're saved, you have a blessed hope that it's not the end. It's going to be better. So ungodliness, worldly passions, and un- this is what you're filling, lawlessness, they summarize the sins named in Titus. Ungodliness, worldly passions, and lawlessness in this passage here are summarizing what the letter of Titus is talking about the whole time. But the life of grace, looking forward to the blessed hope of God's glory, Jesus Christ himself, it is summarized as self-controlled, fill it in upright, godly, and zealous for good works, purified and redeemed. Look at the difference there. So, in what areas of your life do you need God's grace to shine on? Be praying that the Lord will convict you of those areas. Sometimes we're blind to them. Ask the Holy Spirit to convict you. Ask the Lord for grace to show you the areas in which you are not living according to the hope of glory and the beautiful truth of what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. So, Identify the sin. Ask the Lord to identify the sin and its empty promise. Pray that God will teach you to trust in his promises instead. And get to know his promises. Don't live another week filling your mind with the promises of this world, filling your mind with the desires of this world, right? Fill your mind with godliness. Get to know the character of God. Look to Christ. Behold him. Look at his commands and see Jesus. See what he has done. See what he will do. And trust in those promises of the future hope instead. So, pray. Read your Bibles. I will close on this, but before you pack up, don't pack up yet, I'm going to close on this. Karl Marx, an atheist, I discovered him in fifth grade. He began a book with this quote, religion is the opium of the masses. Famous quote, religion is the opium, it's the drug that causes us not to worry, of the masses. That's what he said. And when I heard that in fifth grade, it hit me. And I thought, I know what he's saying against Jesus. I know what he's saying against my faith. And it stayed with me. Until I read this quote by this name that no one can pronounce here probably. His name is Cheslav Maiwov, believe it or not. He witnesses the atrocities of World War II in Poland. He's Polish. He witnesses what happens there. And this is what he says. He says, A true opium of the people is a belief in nothingness after death. The huge solace of thinking that our betrayals, greed, cowardice, and murders are not going to be judged. You see, the people who committed those atrocities had a dead hope. They did not have a living hope, or they would not have lived that way. Because when one has a living hope, what we do here actually matters. If you do not have a living hope, I'm sorry, it just doesn't matter then, if that is true. That is the opium of the masses, though. Because the truth is, it does. And Hebrews 9.27, look at what it says there. It says, and it is appointed for man to live and then die, and then comes the judgment. This is true. How are you going to be found on the day of judgment? Are you going to be found hidden in Christ, beholding Jesus Christ, trusting in him, saying he is my only hope, I am not righteous, I only am going to be with you by your grace alone, that is it because I do not deserve it. Is that your answer? Is that your hope? Is that what you're resting in? 
Or is this all you have? You see, the grace of God to become a man, to humble himself to become a man and die for sinners, promising eternal life to those who are born again to this hope, it changes everything. Believe in his promises. Trust in him. Understand this grace that you don't deserve. Look to Christ. Behold him. And look to the glory of Christ, the appearing of God our Savior. Let's pray.